Amen. So anyway, let's go ahead. Let's pray. Let's get into the word of God. Um, once you open your Bibles, once again, to Acts chapter four. Now, we, we, we stopped here last week. We were talking about, I asked you guys a question about, about history. And the reason I asked you the question about does history matter? What do you think about history? Is so that you can start seeing the book of Acts as a book of history. It's a book um, that literally conveys the history of the church. And I asked the question, what do you learn from history? And you guys are so smart, of course, and you know, and you came back with all the right answers, you know, that we learn from history. It teaches us um, the things that we need to know. And so, but but toward our lesson of last week, and we had a wonderful lesson last week, uh, we get to chapter four, and we never got to this part. Chapter four, verses 32 to 37. And um, it begins to talk about something called the oneness of spirit. Let me pull up the lesson here. Um, yeah, let me pull up the lesson here. Okay. Um, I didn't realize you didn't have the message to lesson here. Uh, there we go. Okay, there we go. Okay, great. So, and I and I titled this the spirit of oneness. And um, we'll go ahead and we'll start off here. And let me see. I believe I saw Ebony today. Ebony, you want to help me read this this evening? Are you available? I'd be more than happy to. Okay, great. Let me. But so we're going to read Acts chapter 4 for you guys. Come on, Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 37. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of these things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet and distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So let's go back a little bit. For those of you that haven't been with us for a minute, um, we find the apostle Peter and John. And um, this lame man had been healed. And the authorities of that time, the scribes and the Pharisees, um, was not happy because of the preaching of Jesus. And so they were arrested and they were brought to the, the court of the, of the authorities of the Jews at that time. So um, they couldn't find a reason to keep them because the crowd was so happy that this lame man that they had known all their lives is now walking it is it is evident that a miracle is taking place. And so they have to let them go because they don't want to upset the crowd. You gotta remember uh, the crowd, the mob back in Roman days uh, kind of ruled what was gonna take place. Um, there was nothing to stop them anyway. So anyway, long story short. So they finally get released and, and Peter and John, they go back um, to the church because remember the, the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the day of Pentecost, and this is the beginning of the church. And so they told them everything that happened. And the Bible says that they, they prayed to God. And the Bible goes on and says, and that the church itself was shaken with the great power in the presence of God. And people were filled again with the Holy Spirit. And it's after this experience of them being united and they cried to God in one voice. They prayed to God, get this, they prayed to God in one voice. And then this is the result of them praying to God, getting filled with the Holy Spirit. Now the multitude of those who believe, listen, was one heart and one soul. 
And then they began to understand the need of others. And so those that had, those that were in possession, those that were in positions, come on, of wealth, of money, come on, made sure that those that did not have, come on, um, uh, were taken care of and that their needs were taken care of. And they came and they, they did what they sold their positions and made the money down at the apostles' feet. Now, the truth is, if you pay your tithes, <laughs> if you just, if everybody just pays the tithes, this, this is not going to happen all the time. And this, this does that we can take care of the needs of, of those, come on, uh, in the church when people have needs. It is a, it's interesting because what God here is communicating, uh, the history, uh, when we take a look at it, is the need and the purpose and, and God's, <clears throat> God's idea of his church is that they are to be one. And then we find it here being demonstrated. And I love it because it says, with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection. So the spirit of God was moving and the grace of God was upon them and miracles and signs and wonders will follow those that what? That believe unity brought about a great move of God uh, in that time. And then they go on in verse 36. I want you to pay attention to this because this person that they named Barnabas um, was a Levite. So you got to understand um, he was a priest of the Old Testament who had converted to Christianity. And so they're making a statement that even he, come on, was so moved, come on, by the presence of God that he did what? That he sold everything he had. Come on and came and laid there at the apostles' feet. What a move of God. This is what the spirit of oneness uh, does. Come on. Uh, and what the spirit of, of, of God is actually supposed to do in all of us. It is the Holy Spirit that unites us. It is interesting to me that in today's Christianity and teaching that we can bring every other component to create oneness but we cannot control the spirit of God. And we will use everything as a substitute of oneness and not realize, come on, if you are not walking in the spirit, if you are not connected to God, come on, and you don't get the stuff that, that, that keeps you disconnected, it will work. If you cannot be connected to others. If you are not in one with God, you cannot be in one with others. The greatest challenge of the church today is that we are not united in the Holy Spirit. We, I don't care what denomination you have. I don't care what, what, what place you go to to worship. Come on, the most important thing of all is to be of what one heart, one soul, meaning one mind and the Holy Spirit. That's what unites the body of Christ. And that's the hardest, and that's the one thing that this devil wants to always do is keep us divided. Because divided, that's the only way he can conquer. Come on, I have power with the church. But if we ever unite, if we ever unite in the Christ, there will be such a move of God. And the and the God only moves in powerful ways when the children of God come united in his spirit. But let's go on and see what else it says. So I have here first. On that note, first believers, come on, to demonstrate the unity of the kingdom of God, that Jesus, come on, he prayed about this in the gospel of John chapter 17, verse 20, 23, uh, becoming one with the Father and the Son. A lot of people don't realize when they hear this, they don't realize that he's talking about the only way you can become one is in spirit. And so he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And so in other words, this would happen when the believers were what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. And then what? Turn around and walk in the Spirit. Now you can get filled with the Holy Spirit and then quench the Spirit. You can get, come on, filled with the Holy Spirit and then decide to be carnal. Come on, you not only have to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but then you have to start walking in the Holy Spirit. You know, um, it is supernatural. I'm sorry, there's no switch you can turn on. It's, come on, you got to surrender to God. You got to give yourself over to the Lord in order for you to be walking in the spirit of God. Come on, you're either 
the, the truth is you're either walking in self or you're walking in the spirit. If you're walking in spirit, you're yielded to God. If you're walking in self, come on, you, you, you're quenching the Holy Spirit. The truth is, is we all do it and we all struggle with it day and night because the Bible says that the spirit what does what? It wrestles. There's a wrestling going on inside of all of us. There's just this war taking place. Spirit, what? Wars, come on, against the flesh. And the flesh wars against the spirit. And so we're constantly having to make these adjustments within ourselves. If there's ever going to be unity like this, this example, this history of the church, come on, if there's ever going to be a unity, you got to surrender. You got to surrender to God. And it's not just one person has surrendered. Everybody has to surrender unto the Lord. Okay, so let's go on. So Galatians, and I love this, Galatians chapter 5, verses uh, 16, I, I got it right. And I say to them, walk in the spirit and you should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It is the lust of the flesh or something carnal that will always divide us. And when you go to Galatians chapter five and, and you read verse 19, it talks about the lust of the flesh and the different components of the flesh and how it operates. But Jesus, and then he turns around and starts walking up Talks, excuse me, starts talking about the fruit of the spirit. In other words, when you do walk in the spirit, you walk in love. You walk in peace. You walk in joy. You walk in gentleness. You walk in kindness. That's what it means to walk in the spirit. Galatians 5 and 25 and verses 26, it says, and if we live in the spirit, let us walk in the spirit. And he, listen, it's verse 26, and then he goes back to the things of flesh. And let us not become conceited, provoking one another, what? To envy one another. And so he, he's, he's given us an example, the Apostle Paul here in the book of Galatians, of what it means. What's the difference between walking in the spirit, come on, and walking in the flesh? And it's the flesh that always does what keeps us, what, divided. It is the spirit and the spirit alone that keeps us, what, united. So the Holy Spirit has everything to do with the unity of the church. It's not, it's not whether you are uniformed, it's not what program you have, it's not that you're, your ethnic background, come on, it's not your ethnicity, it's not any of those things. It is the Holy Spirit. When we are yield to the Spirit and what we become one with God and God becomes one with us, then we can become one with each other. It is supernatural. You cannot do this in natural. I was having a conversation with someone today and I was bringing up the subject. And they brought up the fact, yeah, that's why we got a fellowship. And I was listening, yeah, that's that's right. That's why we got to sit down and eat and fellowship. And I was kind of like, okay, but you're still missing the point. I wasn't able to convey because this person was convinced that us becoming one was more about our fellowship. Come on. Than the an eternal fellowship with God and with each other. Yes, that's a path, but that's not the end. Yes, that's a a practical thing to do, but that's not the conclusion of what it means to be one uh, spirit, one mind, one soul. There's some inner things that have to take place. Come on, in your heart, and there's some inner things that have to take place. There's some agreement and some things of God that have to take place in you. Come on, before it can. And here's the thing, and God is the focus, because if I'm one with him, then I'm coming to agreement with God. Come on, and that way we can't be in disagreement with each other because we're both in agreement with God. If you're ever in disagreement, come on, someone's not in agreement with God. But let's go to John uh, chapter 17, verses 20 to 23. And let's read that one right there. I do not pray for, those, for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Hey Amen. What I love about this, you really got to slow down and read this. You just got to just really just slow down and read it to get the full impact and meaning of what Jesus is praying about. And first of all, when he says, and, and I, I got another version of this, but I want to I want to break this down a little bit because Jesus is praying about his disciples and, and he's saying, look, I do not pray for these alone. I'm, I'm praying for every believer. Jesus was praying for you before you even got saved. 
And what was he praying about? You know, you say, okay, well, gee, that's awesome. Think about that. Jesus was praying about us. He had us in mind when he was praying. Amen. For he says, for all, um, but also for those who will believe in me through the apostles' words. So a part of the apostles' words is the written what? Words to the church. Verse 21, that they all may be one. God wants us. Here's the prayer of Jesus. Here's the heart of God. Oh, hallelujah. You want to talk? They sing songs about the heart of the Father, the heart of God. Uh, come on, when you want to know God's heart and God's will for your life, people, I, I want to know God's will for my life. Yeah, God's will and God's heart is that you would be united to each other. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, think about that. Oh, hallelujah. That they all may be one as you. Then he says he gives an example. In other words, come on, he doesn't leave anything out. He says, as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they may also be one in us. So you say, how did you get to this place where you're talking about we're one with God and then we're one with each other? I just read it. That's, that's the heart of it. That's his prayer. That's Jesus' prayer to the Father is that we would be one in them. Come on, they're already perfect. They're already holy. Come on, they're already righteous. Come on, they're already, come on, uh, glorious. They're God. And God wants us to be one with God. He wants us to be one with them. And that's that's the interesting thing. So, And then he says, here's the example. There's no arguments between the father and the son. There's no disagreements. There's no division between them. They are perfectly united. And then he goes on and he says something, come on, that most Christians will not even touch. He says that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, here's the interesting thing. Again, talking to someone today, and we're talking about basically evangelism and, and how to reach people for Christ. And, um, and we come up with all these ideas of why people don't believe God. And Jesus is praying the answer. There are people that will believe God when the church has a united front. Not just a united front, just united for inner being of being with God, that we become one with God and one with each other. Not one with our preferences, not one with the church that we like and the people that we like or the minister that we like, but one, so much one with God that we walk in the spirit and we demonstrate love, joy, and peace. That the world, in other words, the world is only going to believe you when you become one with me and one with each other. Then it goes on in verse 22. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. What glory is you talking about? His spirit, his anointing, his glory, his person. You remember when Jesus, come on, was headed to the, to the uh, wilderness and John the Baptist, he came to John the Baptist and and um, the Bible says that he got baptized and the Bible says the spirit of God came and descended upon Jesus as a dove. He's talking the glory of God, the glory of God, the presence, the Shekinah glory, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. God and, and the form of the Holy Spirit, the glory of God, the love of God. Oh, hallelujah. You cannot walk in the Holy Spirit and not walk in the love of God, the Shekinah glory of God. Verse 23, he goes on and he says something else. Listen to this. I in them and you and me. Here we go. That they may be made perfect and one. Wow, there's a lot of oneness happening here, isn't it? Wait, a minute, so hold on. You mean to tell me the perfection? Come on, the complete, the wholeness only comes. Come on, we, when we be, do what become one with God and one with each other. In other words, there's some stuff that has to be adjusted. Now you got to understand that this is a process. This is not something that just takes place just that day. This is a process that takes place because there's some process that has to take. Uh, a hole inside of me so that I've surrendered to God in his way. I've surrendered to God, come on, in his will. I've surrendered to God in his will that me and you are supposed 
supposed to be united in him. And that the world may know. I love it when God repeats himself that you have sent me. And I have loved them as you've loved me. It's a whole lot of love going on, a whole lot of glory going on, a whole lot of oneness. And if you come on, so when God talks about being one with him, he's talking about his love. Come on, God, I go to prepare a place for you. See, I love it when Jesus says, look, look, I'm leaving. And he says, well, you know, Jesus, where are you going? He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And where I am, you will be also. In other words, I love you so much that when this life is over, you will be with me for an eternity. Hold on. And if I'm one with God, I love God so much. Come on, that when I leave here, I want to be with God. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, to understand the revelation of chapter John 17 is to understand that you're in this world, but you're not of this world. Oh, hallelujah. The kingdom of God is not of this world. We are of the kingdom of God. And we are to be one with him and one with each other. It's interesting because most people, whether they believe it or not, prefer their preference of their own flesh and don't even know it. Because, you know, follow, you know, the preference of the flesh is a lot easier to exercise than the desire of walking in the spirit. Because walking in the spirit means you have to deny the flesh. Okay, let's go on, because I want to read same scripture. Now, this is a different version. Same scripture, John 17, verses 20 to 22. I am not praying for these alone, but for also for the future believers who will come to me because of the testimony of these. My prayer for all of them is that they will be of one heart and mind, just as you and I are. Father that just as you are in me and I am in you, so they will be in us and the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, the glorious unity of being one as we are. The glorious unity of being one. Wow, so you mean the glory was about being united? Wow. That's what the glory is. The glory is about being so united. Come on, that we're one with God and one with each other. We're just like God. If you want to be like God, you got to be united. If you want to be like God, you got to be not united with each other. Um, <laughs> there's so many things that we get caught up in. Okay, 23. I in them and you in me, all being perfected into one so that the world will know you sent me and will understand that you love them as much as you love me. You know, when I think about how is it that the world's going to, by us being united, understand that Jesus really came? That's, that's saying a lot. So you mean to tell me that this unity between God and believers speaks so loud that unbelievers begin to believe in Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's what he's saying. He's saying that I, the love that we would have for God and for each other will literally make the disbelieve believe. Amen. Number one, unity among the people of God is critical for the revealing of the visible manifestation of the glory of God. They were unified spiritually and materially unity i love this because you know you can become so spiritual that you don't think the manifestations of the material world matters no it does matter of fact it just takes on a different value oh god somebody do that somebody write that down so come on so in other words come on when i really become spiritual Oh, hallelujah. Come on. Oh, hallelujah. The material things in the world take on a different value. <laughs> They're really not that important anymore. 
I'm not talking about being poor to show that you're spiritual. I'm talking about putting things in their proper perspective. Doesn't mean that, come on, you work hard and you can't have anything. I'm just saying it's just as not as valuable. Come on, before you would work hard and get a car, somebody scratch at you and have a fit. Once you get saved, you work hard, God gives you a car, somebody scratches you, oh, it's just a car. You, you, you know, you, it's not that big of a deal. Or, come on, somebody needs something. Come on, come on. You're not so caught up in how much you have that you're not willing to do something for somebody else. Matter of fact, it becomes a joy to help. It becomes a joy. You begin to thank God that you're in a position to help your brother, to help your sister, to help someone, to do something for someone. You see yourself as being blessed by God with so that you can give. Oh, hallelujah. What did the church do? Hallelujah. They saw a great need. Oh, hallelujah. And they understood, come on, that this life was not eternal. So they went and sold, come on, the, the physical things, come on, land, houses, come on. I don't know how old these people were, but they 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 understood, they understood something that I guess we take for granted. Come on, they understood to come on that that uh look naked I came into this world and naked I'm leaving. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. So they went and sold, come on, the house. Are you start talking to people about this right now. This is not a subject folks want to talk about. I worked hard, come on, to get to where I am. You're talking about something everything I have that gives us some folks I don't know, not going to happen to most people. Amen? <laughs> That's so true. But, oh, but these were so, come on, filled with the presence and the anointing of God. They had to have been full, not half full, not on what, three quarters of a tank, but come on, they had to be full. And what happened was all of a sudden the material things took on a different value. They had a different purpose. And that's how we, we need to understand. Because truth is, is I buried, I've been in ministry for almost 30 some odd, almost 30 years uh, in ministry. I've been saved a little long, but in ministry for 30 some odd years. And uh, I buried a lot of people. And I always you know it's a ministry. You want to be there for the family. Um, you want to, you know, to celebrate the life that was lived. Um, and uh, sadly to say, but I've been around also, um, to see families fight over the stuff they left. Doesn't have it. It's amazing because that person, come on, that that leaves, you know, you, you just wonder how they would feel about families fighting over what's left. Making a big deal out of what's left. And I've seen it time and time again. And it's just it's so hurtful uh, to think the life that you're celebrating. Come on, it's being quenched by people for stuff that they're not, they're not even going to be able to take themselves. And Okay, let's go on. Two, um, when there's disunity, the Holy Spirit is quenched and there is no activity of the union, a unity working in the Holy Spirit. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to quench the Holy Spirit? Quench is what? To extinguish. You just put it out. You hear that little voice? You hear the Holy Spirit say, don't say that. You hear the Holy Spirit say, don't do that. And you just go ahead and the flesh takes over. You say, and you do what you want to do. And the Holy Spirit takes a back seat. The Holy Spirit will talk to you, but he's not going to slam you down and make you do anything. The Holy Spirit will nudge you. The Holy Spirit will lead you, but he's not going to make you do anything. You have to yield. Do not quench. The Holy Spirit. Do not extinguish. Come on, the Spirit of God. And uh, you know, we we always love to say, you know, this per the devil. You know, well, the devil ain't making you do anything. Truth is, come on, the truth behind uh, spiritual warfare. The devil ain't making you do nothing. Come on, he he'll tempt you. He'll put something out there for you to bite on. He'll he'll get somebody to get riled up to see. Come on, to see what comes out of you. But it was come on. But the devil has not made you do anything. You choose to operate in the flesh and you don't recognize spiritual warfare because the enemy's always trying to get you to come out of character. But to make you do something, he's not going he's, he's to twist your arm. Amen. Especially after you get saved. Amen. Ephesians 4 um, and verse 3, endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So here we go again. Here's Apostle Paul talking about the same thing Jesus talked about. And this word endeavor, I love it, because it means strive, attempt, undertake, labor. In other words, come on, there's work to be done when we're trying to what? 
be united. There's things I choose not to say because it will cause division. There's things you have to choose not to do because it will cause division. Endeavor, and we're gonna strive, attempt, undertake, labor. Come on, unity is more important, come on, than you being right. You know, some folks just gotta be right. Some folks just gotta show you how smart they are. I, I laugh because uh, you get in some meetings and uh, so you have a discussion that's going on and, and we have people, come on, that are bright, smart. And I'm not just not talking about in church, I'm just talking about uh, throughout throughout life. You got some people very uh, competitive and they gotta be right. And, and their view, come on, the way they see it, come on, has to be heard. Come on, it has to be right. And, and that they'll argue you up and down, come on, that they're right. You know what? You're, that's not the spirit of God. I I see people wrong all the time. Um, but sometimes you just got to be quiet and let them be wrong. Why? Because you're not trying to start an argument. Be quick to hear and slow to speak. There's a reason God wants you to be a listener more so than a speaker. Because when you listen, you can hear what's going on before you decide to speak on it. When you take the time to hear what the spirit of God is saying, somebody say, come on, what the spirit of God is saying to the church. Come on, you're the church. And sometimes the spirit of God will tell you, Shh, be quiet, leave that alone. Endeavor to keep the unity. So unity just in, it's not just one day. Unity is an eternity. And this is what he's talking. This is the history that we see. This is the church that God is building. This is the heart of God. A united church is a, is a good church. I love this right here. This is, I call this the sins of your brother in Christ. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses to even hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. A heathen and a tax collector. I have to stop you here right now. I got to break this down. 15 to 17. I love this. This is so powerful. Listen to this. Again, just when you go over it slowly, hear what Jesus is communicating to us. If your brother sin against you, go tell him his fault between you and him. In other words, but here's the thing. I love it because he says, uh, he says, first of all, he says alone. And he says, and if he hears you, you've gained your brother. First of all, telling someone about their fault is not to prove that you're right, to prove that they did something wrong. That's the mistake so many people make. They are offended. And so because they are offended, now they have to go tell you that you have offended me as if you have never offended someone else, as if you've never done anything wrong. So we come in with this attitude, we come in with this thing with how we not feeling it, and, you know, and I gotta tell this person and, but, or our, or we may not even do that. We may come in a very elegant, intelligent way, but our motives is that, that you will know that you didn't get away with something, but that you are wrong. And so our motives are wrong. Come on, therefore, we don't gain our brother. The whole idea of someone sinning against you and going to, to have a conversation with them is that you what you're gain, you're giving an opportunity to gain unity. I love it. He says, if he hears you, if you if you tell them this in love, if you're saying to them that, you know, we don't want to be divided. You know, I want to be united. I don't want to feel any kind of way with you when we're in the room. I, I want to get this behind us because we're brothers. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. We're supposed to be united. So let's let's get let's let's talk this out. Let's get this over so that we can be united. You have gained your brother. And a lot of people don't understand uh 16, but if he will not hear you, then what do you do? You go get counsel in the multitude of 
of, of counsel, there is safety. And take with you two or more that they mouth out of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. In other words, now you bring wiser people. Usually it's the pastor, some elders of the church. Uh, you, you bring them and you say, hey, you know, I got this issue, but here's my, here's what I want. I, I don't want the church to go through any, you know, I don't, I don't want there to be any disunity. Come on. You can. And so now the two go and say, okay. And what do they do? They, they judge. Come on. The mature Christians are there to also help people. What? Um, get through these problems in life. And, um, and so they go and they sit down again with the idea of doing what? Creating unity to gain that brother, to gain it, sister. Verse 17, if they refuse to hear them, then what do you do? Now, this is this is a hard one. I've never seen a church do this. You tell it to the church. Now, you know what most church folks would do? You, you know, you're telling their business. <laughs> we had a little incident once when I had to tell the church something, and there were some people, bless their hearts, who took it the wrong way. As if I was telling on someone whom, whom I've already had permission from to tell. And um, who wanted me to tell because of what happened. And of course, there were some uh, Christians who in their mindset and their flesh, you, you shouldn't be doing that. You're wrong. And, you know, left the church. And uh, tried to um, cause dissension in the church. Bless their hearts. They don't know any better. One finally came back to me and apologized. But actually, a couple did, but it doesn't matter as long as everybody's doing okay. But if they refuse to even hear the church, let them be. Now, here's some strong, strong actions that Jesus is telling us and why. Let them be like a heathen and a tax collector. In other words, good riddance. Let them go. Separate yourself. You say, well, that's not unity. No, God is not saying unity at any cost. God is saying unity at the right cost. In other words, come on, we're trying to keep the, the problem, come on, out of the unity. Jesus is saying, look, if that person doesn't want to be united with the truth, united in God, united in his purpose, united, God is saying it's better for that person not to be a part of the church. If there are people that, come on, just won't get on board, won't get on the same page. That's fine. God's good with it. Verse 18. Oh, surely. Now, here we go. I got I, I, I to see this. Now, think about all that I just said. And then verse uh, 18 says, oh, surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Oh, wow. So you mean he's talking about unity? Yes. You know, we like to pray. It's so funny. We get so spiritual and we start praying. And we, got, we want you to buy this and we want you to loosen this. And in the context of this scripture, oh, hallelujah, oh, hallelujah. God is talking about the church being what? United with him in purpose and heart and his will. I surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. What is he talking about? He's talking about the church. If you loose whatever you have to let go of to keep the church united, God says, I'm with you. I got it. So when this person leaves the church, God says, okay, I'll deal with them. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. And when you bind, come on, the unity of faith and the unity of the spirit and love and joy and peace, come on. When you bind that, God says, I'm with you. For whether there are two or more gathered together in my name, there I am also in the midst of them. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, because you're binded to the truth and you're binded to my unity and my covenant. I'll be there. And God comes and sits down. Oh, hallelujah. In the midst of the church. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. And he sits himself down. Hallelujah. And wonderful, beautiful things begin to happen in the church. And that evil, come on, is loosed in a way and has no strength, has no power, has no say. But when you allow that kind of stuff to continue, we've had some situations where we've had to talk to some people and they didn't want to go along with the program and they had to leave. And you know what? The numbers were smaller, but guess what? But the unity was still there. And I would rather have the peace. Here's the thing. And I remember when I first started pastoring and this thought came to mind because people were telling me about um, 
some previous things that happened. And I pastored a church um, that had, you know, been around for a hundred years. And they were telling me, you know, they would come to church and all this chaos and drama. And the only thing I could think of was the world's got so much chaos and drama. When I go out the door and come on to my job and all the stuff that's going on in society, the last place I want to come to was some drama and some foolishness is to the church. Now, come on. And so here's God saying what? Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Keep the drama, come on, out of the house. Verse 19, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by the Father in heaven. Now, of course, they have this has to be anything. And I, I imagine there's other things out, but he's talking about according to the will of God. For where two or three are gathered together, and listen, I love this, in my name. Now, you know, when you gather together in his name, now, again, he's talking about church. When you gather together in the name of the Lord, he says, I am there in the midst. In other words, he's talking about this. Both of us are coming uh, because of everything that Jesus stand for. Don't get it twisted. You know, just because if you come for you, because you got some folks, they don't come in the name of Jesus. They, they, they don't really know what Jesus wants. All they know is what they want out of life. Okay, let's go on. So this glory of God, unity does not exist in uh, politics. You should got to get a lot of Christians that want to talk about, um, you know, what you're voting for. You know, so the, the truth is, is of the which of the two evils are you going to vote for? Uh, remember, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Remember that we're, we're. I'm not saying you shouldn't vote. That's that's not the case. You vote for how the Lord leads you, but um, politics is not. That's not unity. That's not Christ. We don't bring politics to the church. That's not going to save you. Personal preference, your your style, the style of music, your um, you know your personal preference. I hear people all the time. Say, well, you know, I go to this church because this church offers this. They're looking for the perks. It's got a good youth ministry. It's got this. It's got that. You know, because you think that that's going to save. You better go where God pray. You better pray and, and go where God tells you to. Personal preference. Sometimes God might have you go be a part of a ministry that needs help. Ethnicity, culture, economic status. There's a lot of people go to places because of its economic status. So oh, they're doing so much. That's not unity. Pride or selfish ambition, what makes you feel good about yourself because you, you know, you are a part of something that's taking place. And so that's not unity. Of course, contention, disputes, arguments, you know, who's right, who's better. That's not unity. So we are united by salvation. I love Galatians 3, 26, verse 29. He explains it all. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you all are one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I love it. For you are all sons of God. What? Through faith in Jesus Christ. And here we go, verse 27 again. And he says, listen to this. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, listen to this, and here's the question. Have you put on Christ? Folks get baptized, but they're not putting on Christ. They're not, you know what? They're not acting like Christ. They're not united with Christ. Come on, they're not, they're not, they're not picking up the cross and following Christ. Christ has nothing to do, come on, with their walk with God. And, and Paul in the book of Galatians explains it all. It's not about you being Jewish or Gentile. It's not about your color. It's not about your sex. 
Come on, it's not about any of those things. It's not about your status in life. It's that's what? For you are all one in Christ. What? United by salvation. Sinners saved by grace. I say this all the time. It's funny because I some some of the Christians that I know, they get saved and all of a sudden they start looking at the world as, as us and them. You know, the only difference between us and them is the, the salvation of Jesus. That's it. You are sinners. Sinners. All is sin and falling short of the glory of God. You can do well to remember you are a sinner saved by grace. You are a sinner washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. And, and, and the Bible says that Jesus died for the world. He died for them too. So even, you know, don't get mad at the world because you were once them. And it always tickles me how people, Christians, come on, God cleans you up. God blesses you and does some things. And all of a sudden you got issues. Come on with people. I have a hard, hard time when I see, I hear pastors talk about those liberals. You know, and I'm looking, I'm going, wow, why don't you just preach Jesus to them? Why don't you just treat Jesus? Do you know that Jesus, Jesus took the time, instead of being around the religious folks, that Jesus, which the Bible says that Jesus went and sat with the tax collectors and Jesus went and sat with the prostitutes. He went and sat and had dinner with the sinners. Now, they, they couldn't, don't get me wrong, Bible says, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, because he's talking about those who are brand new in the Lord. And come on, you don't want your, your good habits to come bad because you can't handle being around such sin. But Jesus didn't have a problem with you. When you become mature enough, you won't have a problem with being around, come on, such sinners. But the Bible says he was around those sinners. Do you think that Jesus, come on, being around them helped convert them? Yes, that's exactly what it did. And so what? But well, we are neither what? Jew, Greek, neither slave nor free. Now that's a hard one to swallow for some people. Some people are slaves. And he's saying, look, look, being a slave in this world is nothing to being what? A son of God. Matter of fact, what Jesus was saying, I notice it's going to be hard for some people, but what Jesus was saying, even as a slave, you are free inside of your soul. Even though you were living in this evil world, come on, you were free inside. You were free. Your spirit was free. You knew. Your eyes were open. You could see what that 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 hard master could not see. That evil man, that evil person that was making, keeping you a slave. You had more freedom than they had. So he's going on and he's explaining all of this. What matters? The unity that we have is our salvation in Christ, our faith in Jesus Christ. Well, it looks like we're not going to make it to the spirit of, of, of oneness. <laughs> um, there's some really more good, some good stuff about what unity and, and how it impacts uh, our lives and what, what God has intended for his church. And there are many terms. Okay. Okay, well, let's just stop it. Okay, I was told I was frozen, so it was a good place to just stop. Wherever it froze, we just stopped right there. <laughs> so, um, hey, with that, let's pray. And you guys, let's go ahead and, and then we'll open up for some discussion. And I want to say this, I'll close with this. Unity, our unity is the heart of God. Um, if you ever want to know the will of God, this is this this means a lot to the Lord that we be united, um, that we care for each other, um, that we look out for each other. For if we cannot look out for each other, how can we look out for the world? If we can't be united as Christians, um, how can we? What, what, that's that's hypocrisy. We can't get along, then we want to do what? We want to tell the world how to get along. Let's bow your heads in a word of prayer. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you um, for the spirit of oneness. We thank you for John chapter 17 and how you desire your children, your people, those whom you have redeemed to be one. Father, I pray this prayer as well that we all will become one as you are in the Father and the Father, that you will be one in us and we will be one together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Okay, amen. Well, let's go ahead. Let's open it up. Comments, statements, ideas, testimonies.